introduction and dedication of romance of california life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by david wales romance of california life by john haberton introduction Many of the sketches contained in Some Folks were written by me during the last five years, and some of them published by Mr. Leslie in his illustrated newspaper and his chimney corner, from which journals they have been collected by friends who believe that in these stories is displayed better workmanship than I have since done. For myself I can claim for them only an unusual degree of that unliterary and unpopular quality called truthfulness although at present mildly tolerated in the east i was brought up in the west and have written largely from recollection of some folks i have known veritable men and women scenes and incidents and otherwise through the memories of western friends of good eyesight and hearing powers should any one accuse me of having imitated bret hart style i shall accept the accusation as a compliment for i know of no other american story writer so worthy to be taken as a teacher by men who acceptably tell the stories of new countries for occasionally introducing characters and motives that would not be considered disgraceful in virtuous communities i can only plead in excuse the fact that even in the new west some folks will occasionally be uniformly thoughtful respectable and honest just as individuals sometimes are in the east john haberton new york july first eighteen seventy seven dedication to frank leslie who while other publishers were advising the writer of these sketches to write supplied the author with encouragement in the shape of a publishing medium and the lucre which all literary men despise but long for this volume is respectfully dedicated by the author end of introduction and dedication Story One of Romance of California Life by John Haberton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story One The School Teacher at Bottle Flat. It certainly was hard. What was the freedom of a country in which the voice of the original founders was spent in vain? Had not they, the forty miners of Bottle Flat, really started the place? Hadn't they located claims there? hadn't they contributed three ounces each ostensibly to set up in business a brother miner who unfortunately lost an arm but really that a saloon might be opened and the genuineness and stability of the camp be assured hadn't they promptly killed or scared away every chinaman who had ever trailed his celestial pigtail into the flat hadn't they cut and beaten a trail to placerville so that miners could take a run to that city when the flat became too quiet hadn't they framed the squarest bedding code in the whole diggings and when a frisco man basely attempted to break up the camp by starting a gorgeous saloon a few miles up the creek hadn't they gone up in a body and cleared him out giving him only ten minutes in which to leave the creek forever all this they had done actuated only by a stern sense of duty and in the patient anticipation of the reward which traditionally crowns virtuous action but now oh ingratitude of republics a school-teacher was to be forced upon bottle flat in spite of all the protest which they the oldest inhabitants had made such had been their plaint for days but the sad excitement had not been productive of any fights for the few married men in the camp prudently absented themselves at night from the nugget saloon where the matter was fiercely discussed every evening there was therefore such an utter absence of diversity of opinion that the most quarrelsome searched in vain for provocation on the afternoon of the day on which the opening events of this story occurred the boys by agreement stopped work two hours earlier than usual for the stage usually reached bottle flat about two hours before sundown and the one of that day was to bring the hated teacher the boys had well-nigh given up the idea of further resistance 
yet curiosity has a small place even in manly bosoms and they could at least look hatred at the detested pedagogue so about four o'clock they gathered at the nugget so suddenly that several fathers who were calmly drinking inside had barely time to escape through the back windows the boys drank several times before composing themselves into their accustomed seats and leaning places but it was afterward asserted and southpaw the one-armed barkeeper cited as evidence that none of them took sugar in their liquor they subjected their sorrow to homeopathic treatment by drinking only the most raw and rasping fluids that the bar afforded the preliminary drinking over they moodily whittled chewed and expectorated a stranger would have imagined them a batch of miserable criminals awaiting transportation the silence was finally broken by a decided-looking red-haired man who had been neatly beveling the doorpost with his knife and who spoke as if his words only by great difficulty escaped being bitten in two we can burn down the schoolhouse right before his face and eyes and then maybe the state board'll get our ideas about education twon't be no use mose said judge barber whose legal title was honorary and conferred because he had spent some time in a penitentiary in the east them state board fellers is wrong but they've got grit or they'd never have got the schoolhouse done after we rode the contractor out of the flat on one of his own boards besides some of em might think we was a robin it in and next thing you know they'd be buildin us a jail can't we buy off these young uns folks queried an angular fellow from southern illinois they're a miserable pack of shots and i believe they'd all leave the camp for a few ounces yes drawled the judge dubiously but thar's the widow jennies she'd pan out a pretty good schoolroom full with her eight young uns and there ain't ounces enough in the diggins to make her leave while tom guinea's coffin's roostin under the rocks then said mose the first speaker his words escaping with even more difficulty than before throw round gears to see who's to marry the widder and boss or young uns the feller that gets the fust jacks to do the job made it no insult to this highly respectable crowd said the judge in a very bland tone and inviting it to walk up to the bar and specify its consolation i don't believe there's one of yer the widders have the judge's eye glanced along the line at the bar and he continued softly but in decided accents not a cussed one but added the judge passing his pouch to the barkeeper if anything's to be done it must be done lively for the stage is pretty nigh here tell you what's as good as anything we'll crowd round the stage first throwin' keards for who's to pull out his hoof to be accidentally trod on by the infernal teacher as he gets out then satisfaction must be took out of the teacher it be a mean job for these teachers haven't the spunk of a coyote and ten to one they won't have no shootin irons so the job'll have to be done with fists good said mose the crowd drinks with me to a square job and no backin chuck the pasteboard jedge the dickens for mose had got the first jack square job and no backin said the judge with a grin there's the stage now hurry up fellers the stage drew up with a crash in front of the nugget and the passengers outside and in but none looking teacherish hurried into the saloon the boys scarcely knew whether to swear from disappointment or gratification when a start from mose drew their attention again to the stage on the top step appeared a small shoe above which was visible a small section of stocking far whiter and smaller than is usual in the mines in an instant a similar shoe appeared on the lower step and the boys saw successively the edge of a dress a waterproof cloak a couple of small gloved hands a bright muffler and a pleasant face covered with brown hair and a bonnet then they heard a cheerful voice say i'm the teacher gentlemen can any one show me the schoolhouse the miserable mose looked ghastly and tottered a suspicion of a wink graced the judge's eye but he exclaimed in a stern low tone square job and no backin upon which mose took to his heels and the placerville trail the judge had been a married man so he promptly answered i'll take you thar mom as soon as i git your baggage 
thank you said the teacher that valise under the seat is all the judge extracted a small valise marked hulda brown offered his arm and he and the teacher walked off before the astonished crowd as naturally as if the appearance of a modest-looking young lady was an ordinary occurrence at the flat the stage refilled and rattled away from the dumb and staring crowd and the judge returned well boys said he you got to marry two women now to stop that school and you'll find this un more particular than the widder i just tell yer what it's about that school it's a-goin to go on spite of any jackasses that wants it broke up and any gentleman that's insulted can get satisfaction by who wants it broke up yo fool demanded toledo a man who had been named after the city from which he had come and who had been from the first one of the fiercest opponents of the school i move the appointment of a committee of three to wait on the teacher see if the school wants anything money can buy take up subscriptions to get it and lay out any feller that don't come down with the dust when he's went fur hooray bully good sound them's the talk and other sympathetic expressions were heard from the members of the late anti-school party the judge who by virtue of age was the master of ceremonies and general moderator of the camp very promptly appointed a committee consisting of toledo and two miners whose attire appeared the most respectable in the place and instructed them to wait on the school marm and tender her the cordial support of the miners early the next morning the committee called at the schoolhouse attached to which were two small rooms in which teachers were expected to keep house the committee found the teacher putting to right the schoolroom her dress was tucked up her sleeves rolled her neck hidden by a bright handkerchief and her hair a blowin all to glory as toledo afterward expressed it between the exertion the bracing air and the excitement caused by the newness of everything miss brown's pleasant face was almost handsome mornin marm said toledo raising a most shocking hat while the remaining committee men expeditiously ranged themselves behind him so that the teacher might by no chance look into their eyes good morning gentlemen said miss brown with a cheerful smile please be seated i suppose you wish to speak of your children toledo who was a very young man blushed and the whole committee was as uneasy on its feet as if its boots had been soled by fly blisters finally toledo answered not much marm see em ain't got none me and these gentlemen's a committee from the boys from the boys echoed miss brown she had heard so many wonderful things about the golden state that now she soberly wondered whether bearded men called themselves boys and went to school from the miners washing along the crick marm they want to know what they can do for yer continued toledo i am very grateful said miss brown but i suppose the local school committee don't count on them marm interrupted toledo they're livin five miles away and they're only the preacher and doctor and a feller that's jammed the church lately none of em but the doctor ever shows themselves at the saloon and he only comes when there's a difficulty and he's called in to officiate but the boys the boys has got the dust marm and they've got the will one of us'll be in often to see what can be done for yer good morning marm toledo raided his hat again the other committee men bowed profoundly to all the windows and seats and then the whole retired leaving miss brown to the wondering possession of an entirely new experience well inquired the crowd as the committee approached the creek well replied toledo she just a hundred and thirty pound nugget and no mistake eh fellers you bet promptly responded the remainder of the committee good said the judge what does she want toledo's countenance fell by thunder he replied we got out for she had a chance to tell us the judge stared sharply upon the young man and hurriedly turned to hide a merry twitching of his lips that afternoon the boys were considerably astonished and scared at seeing the schoolmistress walking quickly toward the creek the chairman of the new committee was fully equal to the occasion mounting a rock he roared you fellers without no shirts on git you with shoes off put em on take your pants out of your boots hats off when the lady come hurry now no foolin 
the shirtless ones took a lively double quick towards some friendly bushes the boys rolled down their sleeves and pantaloons and one or two took the extra precaution to wash the mud off their boots meanwhile miss brown approached and toledo stepped forward anything wrong up at the schoolhouse said he oh no replied miss brown but i have always had a great curiosity to see how gold was obtained it seems as if it must be very easy to handle those little pans don't you don't you suppose some miner would lend me his pan and let me try just once certainly marm every galoot oven would be glad of the chance here you fellers who got the cleanest pan half a dozen men washed out their pans and hurried off with them toledo selected one put in dirt and water and handed it to miss brown there you are marm but i'm feared you'll wet your dress oh that won't harm cried miss brown with a laugh which caused one enthusiastic miner to cut the pigeon wing she got the miner's touch to a nicety and in a moment had a spray of dirty water flying from the edge of the pan while all the boys stood in a respectful semicircle and stared delightedly the pan empty toledo refilled it several times and finally picking out some pebbles and hard pieces of earth pointed to the dirty shiny deposit in the bottom of the pan and briefly remarked thar tis marm oh screamed miss brown with delight is that really gold dust that's it said toledo i'll just put it up for you so you can carry it oh no said miss brown i couldn't think of it it isn't mine you washed it out marm and that makes it full title in these parts all of the traditional honesty of new england came into miss brown's face in an instant and although she yankee like estimated the value of the dust and sighingly thought how much easier it was to win gold in that way than by forcing ideas into stupid little heads she firmly declined the gold and bade the crowd a smiling good day did you see them little fingers of hern a holdin out that pan did you see her fellers inquired an excited miner yeah and the way she made that dirt git as though she was used to washin that wallopin said another wallopin echoed a staid miner i'd give my claim and throw in my pile to boot to be a young un and get walloped by them plain things of hern just see how she throw dirt and water on them boots said another extending an enormous ugly boot them boots ain't far sale now them ain't them be derned contemptuously exclaimed another she tramped right on my toes as she backed out of the crowd every one looked jealously at the last speaker and a grim old fellow suggested that the aforesaid individual had obtained a trampled foot by fraud and that each man in camp had consequently a right to demand satisfaction of him but the judge decided that he of the trampled foot was right and that any miner who wouldn't take such a chance whether fraudulently or otherwise hadn't the spirit of a man in him yankee sam the shortest man in camp withdrew from the crowd and paced the banks of the creek lost in thought within half an hour sam was owner of the only store in the place had doubled the price of all articles of clothing contained therein and increased at least sixfold the price of all the white shirts next day the sun rose on bottle flat in his usual conservative and impassive manner had he respected the dramatic proprieties he would have appeared with astonished face and uplifted hands for seldom had a whole community changed so completely in a single night uncle hans the only german in the camp had spent the preceding afternoon in that patient investigation for which the teutonic mind is so justly noted the morning sun saw over hans's door a sign in charcoal which read shaven done here and few men went to the creek that morning without submitting themselves to hans's hands then several men who had been absent from the saloon the night before straggled into camp with jaded mules and new attire carondelet joe came in clad in a pair of pants on which slender saffron-hued serpents ascended gracefully gray corinthian columns while from under the collar of a new white shirt appeared a cravat displaying most of the lines of the solar spectrum 
flush the flat champion at poker came in late in the afternoon with a huge watch chain and an overpowering bosom pin and his horrid fingers sported at least one seal ring each several stovepipe hats were visible in camp and even a pair of gloves were reported in the pocket of a miner yankee sam had sold out his entire stock and prevented bloodshed over his only bottle of hair oil by putting it up at a raffle at forty chances at an ounce a chance his stock of white shirts seven in number were visible on manly forms his pocket combs and glasses were all gone and there had been a steady run on needles and thread most of the miners were smoking new white clay pipes while a few thoughtful ones hoping for a repetition of the events of the previous day had scoured their pans to a dazzling brightness as for the innocent cause of all this commotion she was fully as excited as the miners themselves she had never been outside of middle bethany until she started for california everything on the trip had been strange and her stopping place and its people were stranger than all the male population of middle bethany as is usual with small new england villages consisted almost entirely of very young boys and very old men but here at bottle flat were hosts of middle-aged men and such funny ones she was wild to see more of them and hear them talk yet her wildness was no match for her prudence she sighed to think how slightly toledo had spoken of the minister on the local committee and she piously admitted to herself that toledo and his friends were undoubtedly on the brink of the bottomless pit and yet they certainly were very kind if she would only exert a good influence upon these men but how suddenly she bethought herself of the grand social centre of middle bethany the singing school of course she couldn't start a singing school at bottle flat but if she were to say the children needed to be led in singing would it be very hypocritical she might invite such of the miners as were musically inclined to lead the school in singing in the morning and thus she might perhaps remove some of the prejudice which she had been informed existed against the school she broached the subject to toledo and that faithful official had nearly every miner in camp at the schoolhouse that same evening the judge brought a fiddle uncle hans came with a cornet and yellow pete came grinning in with his darling banjo there was a little disappointment all around when the boys declared their ignorance of greenville and bonny doon which airs miss brown decided were most easy for the children to begin with but when it was ascertained that the former was the heir to saw my leg off and the latter was identical with the three black crows all friction was removed and the melodious howling attracted the few remaining boys at the saloon and brought them up in a body led by the barkeeper himself the exact connection between melody and adoration is yet an unsolved religio-psychological problem but we all know that everywhere in the habitable globe the two intermingle and stimulate each other whether the adoration be offered to heavenly or earthly objects and so it came to pass that at the bottle flat singing school the boys looked straight at the teacher while they raised their tuneful voices that they came ridiculously early so as to get front seats and that they purposely sung out of tune once in a while so as to be personally addressed by the teacher and she pure modest prudent and refined saw it all and enjoyed it intensely of course it could never go any further for though there was in middle bethany no moneyed aristocracy the best families scorned alliances with any who were undegenerate and would not be unequally yoked with those who drank swore and gambled let alone the fearful suspicion of murder which miss brown's imagination affixed to every man in the flat but the boys themselves considering the unspeakable contempt which had been manifested in the camp for the profession of teaching and for all who practised it the boys exhibited a condescension truly christian they vied with each other in manifesting it and though the means were not always the most appropriate the honesty of the sentiment could not be doubted 
one by one the greater part of the boys after adoring and hoping saw for themselves that miss brown could never be expected to change her name at their solicitation sadder but better men they retired from the contest and solaced themselves by betting on the chances of those still on the track as an ex-jockey tersely expressed the situation there was no talk of false-hearted or fair temptress such as men often hear in society for not only had all the tenderness emanated from manly breasts alone but it had never taken form of words soon the hopeful ones were reduced to half a dozen of these yankee sam was the favorite among the betting men for sam knowing the habits of new england damsels went to placerville one friday and returned next day with a horse and buggy on sunday he triumphantly drove miss brown to the nearest church ten to one was offered on sam that sunday afternoon as the boys saw the demure and contented look on miss brown's face as she returned from church but samuel followed in the sad footsteps of many another great man for so industriously did he drink to his own success that he speedily developed into a bad case of delirium tremens then carondelet joe calmly confident in the influence of his wonderful pants led all odds in betting but one evening when joe had managed to get himself in the front row and directly before the little teacher that lady turned her head several times and showed signs of discomfort when it finally struck the latter that the human breath might perhaps waft toward a lady perfumes more agreeable than those of mixed drinks he abruptly quitted the school and the camp flush the poker champion carried with him to the singing school that astounding impudence which had long been the terror and admiration of the camp but a quality which had always seemed exactly the thing when applied to poker seemed to the boys barely endurable when displayed toward miss brown one afternoon flush indiscreetly indulged in some triumphant and rather slighting remarks about the little teacher within fifteen minutes flush's final earthly home had been excavated and an amateur undertaker was making his coffin an untimely proposal by a good-looking young mexican and his prompt rejection left the race between toledo and a frenchman named le Comte. it also left miss brown considerably frightened for until now she had imagined nothing more serious than the rude admiration which had so delighted her at first but now who knew but some one else would be ridiculous poor little miss brown suffered acutely at the thought of giving pain and determined to be more demure than ever but alas even her agitation seemed to make her more charming to her two remaining lovers had the boys in the saloon comprehended in the least the cause of miss brown's uneasiness they would have promptly put both le comte and toledo out of the camp or out of the world but to their good-natured conceited minds it meant only that she was confused and unable to decide and unlimited betting was done to be settled upon the retirement of either of the contestants and while patriotic feelings influenced the odds rather in toledo's favour it was fairly admitted that the frenchman was a formidable rival to all the grace of manner and the knowledge of women that seems to run in gallic blood he was a man of tolerable education and excellent taste besides miss brown was so totally different from french women that every development of her character afforded him an entirely new sensation and doubled his devotion toledo stood his ground manfully though the boys considered it a very bad sign when he stopped drinking and spent hours in pacing the ground in front of his hut with his hands behind him and his eyes fixed on the ground finally when he was seen one day to throw away his faithful old pipe heavy betters hastened to hedge as well they might besides as one of the boys truthfully observed he couldn't begin to wag a jaw along with that frenchman but like many other young men he could talk quite eloquently with his eyes and as the language of the eyes is always direct and purely grammatical miss brown understood everything they said and to her great horror once or twice barely escaped talking back the poor little teacher was about to make the whole matter a subject of special prayer when a knock at the door startled her 
she answered it and beheld the homely features of the judge i just come in to talk a little matter that's been bothering me some time you'll pardon me if i talk a little plain said he certainly replied the teacher wondering if he too had joined her persecutors thank ye said the judge looking relieved it's, it's all right i've got darters to hum as big as you be and i want to talk to you as if you was one of them the judge looked uncertain for a moment and then proceeded that feller toledo's dead in love with yer of course you know it though ain't likely he's told yer all i want to say about him is drop him kindly he's been took so bad since you come that he's stopped drinkin and chewin and smokin and cussin and he hasn't played a game at the nugget since the first singin school night maybe this all ain't much to you but you've read about that woman that was spoke well of for doin what she could he's the first feller i've ever seen in the diggins that went back on all the comforts of life and and i've just been a young man myself and knowin how big a claim it's been for him to work i ain't got the heart to see him spiled now but he will be if when you have to drop him you don't do it kindly and just one thing more the quicker he's out of his misery the better the old jailbird screwed up a tear out of his eye with a dirty knuckle and departed abruptly leaving the little teacher just about ready to cry herself but before she was quite ready another knock startled her she opened the door and let in toledo himself good evening marm said he gravely i just come in to make my last official call seein i'm goin away tomorrer is there anything that schoolhouse wants i can get and send from frisco going away ejaculated the teacher heedless of the remainder of toledo's speech yes marm a goin away for good fact is i've been tryin to behave myself lately and i find i need more company at it than i get about the diggins i'm goin some place where i can learn to be the gentleman i feel like bein to be decent and honest and useful and that anybody here it cares to help a feller that way nobody the ancestor of the browns of middle bethany was at lexington on that memorable morning in seventy five and all of his promptness and his courage ten times multiplied swelled the heart of his trembling little descendant as she faltered out Ooh, there's one who asked toledo before he could raise his eyes but though miss brown answered not a word he did not repeat his question for such a rare crimson came into the little teacher's face that he hid it away in his breast and acted as if he would never let it out again another knock at the door toledo dropped into a chair and miss brown hastily smoothing back her hair opened the door and again saw the judge i just dropped back to say commenced the judge when his eye fell upon toledo he darted a quick glance at the teacher comprehended the situation at once and with a loud shout of out of his misery by thunder started on a run to carry the news to the saloon miss brown completed her term and then the minister who was on the local board was called in to formally make her tutor for life to a larger pupil le comte with true french gallantry insisted on being groomsman and the judge gave away the bride the groom who gave a name very different from any ever heard at the flat placed on his bride's finger a ring inscribed within made from gold washed by holda brown the little teacher has increased the number of her pupils by several and her latest one calls her grandma end of story one story two of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story two jim hoxson's revenge one you don't say i do though well i never neither did i exactly don't be provoking ephraim what makes you talk in that devil way well ma the world ain't all squeezed into this yer little town of crankett i've been elsewhere some and i've seed some funny things and likewise some that wasn't so funny as they might be perhaps you have but you needn't always be a settin other folks down maybe crank it ain't the whole world but it seed that awful case of molly cappins and the shipwreck of thirty four when the awful nor'easter was and 
well well mall don't let's fight about it said ephraim with a sigh as he tenderly scraped down a new axe helve with a piece of glass while his wife made the churn dasher hurry up and down as if the innocent cream was ephraim's back and she was avenging thereupon ephraim's insults to crankit and its people deacon ephraim crankit was a descendant of the founder of the village and although now a sixty-year-old farmer he had in his lifetime seen considerable of the world he had been to the fishing banks a dozen times been whaling twice had carried a cargo of wheat up the mediterranean and had been second officer of a ship which had picked up a miscellaneous cargo at the heathen ports of eastern asia he had picked up a great many ideas too wherever he had been and his wife was immensely proud of him and them whenever she could compare them with the men and ideas which existed at crankit but when ephraim displayed his memories and knowledge to her alone oh that was a very different thing anyhow resumed mrs crankit raising the lid of the churn to see if there were any signs of butter it's an everlastin shame jim hoxson's a young feller in good standin in the church and milly botain's an unbeliever they say her father's a regular infidel easy ma easy gently remonstrated ephraim when he seed you lookin at his pet rosebush on your way to church last sunday didn't he hurry and pull two or three and hand em to you yes and what did he have in t'other hand a boasting paper and not a sunday one nother millicent ain't a christian name no how you can fix it it amounts to just about much says she does and that's nothin she's got a soft face and purty hair ef it's all her own which i powerfully doubt and after that thar's nothin to her she's never been to sewin meetin and she's off a boatin with that new york chap every saturday afternoon instead of goin to the young people's prayer meetins she's most supported sam ransom's wife and young ones since sam's smack was lost suggested ephraim that's you deacon crankit replied his wife I always stick up for sinners perhaps you'd make better use of your time ef you'd examine your own evidences wow wife said the deacon she's engaged to that new york feller as you call mr brown so there's no danger of jem being unequally yoked with an unbeliever and i wish her well from the bottom of my heart i don't cried mrs crankit giving the dasher a vicious push which sent the cream flying frantically up to the top of the churn i hope he'll turn out bad and her pride'll be tucked down as the deacon had been long enough at sea to know the signs of a long storm and to know that prudence suggested a prompt sailing out of the course of such a storm when possible so he started for the door carrying the glass and axe helve with him suddenly the door opened and a female figure ran so violently against the axe held that the said figure was instantly tumbled to the floor and seemed an irregular mass of faded pink calico and subdued plaid shawl miss peakin exclaimed mrs crankit dropping the churn dasher and opening her eyes like to have not been whined the figure slowly arising and giving the offending axe helve a glance which would have set it on fire had it not been of green hickory but have you heard what asked mrs crankit hastily setting a chair for the newcomer while ephraim deacon and sixty though he was paused in his almost completed exit he's gone exclaimed miss peakin oh i heard jim had gone to calif pshaw said miss peakin contemptuously that was days ago i mean brown the new york chap milly botain's lover ya don't but i do and what's more he had to there was men come after him in the night time but he must have heard em for they didn't find him in his room and this morning they found that his sailboat has gone too and what's more there's a printed notice up about him and he's a defaulter and there's five thousand dollars for whoever catches him and he stole twenty-five and he's all described in the notice as particular as if he was a full-blood alderney cow poor fellow sighed the deacon for which interruption he received a withering glance from miss peakin they say milly's a goin awful and that she says she'll marry him now if he'll come back but it ain't likely he'll be such a fool now he's got so much money he don't need hern 
reckon her and her father won't be so high and mighty and stuck up now it's powerful discouraging to the righteous to see the ungodly flourishing so and a rollin in their wealth when their better has to be on needles all year for fear the next mackerel catch won't mount to much the idea o her willin to marry a defaulter i can't understand it poor girl sighed mrs crankett wiping one eye with the corner of her apron i'd do it myself if i was her the deacon dropped the axe held and gave his wife a tender kiss on each eye two perhaps mr darwin can tell inquirers why out of very common origin there occasionally spring beings who are very decided improvements on their progenitor but we are only able to state that jim hoxson was one of these superior beings and was himself fully aware of the fact not that he was conceited at all for he was not but he could not help seeing what every one else saw and acknowledged every one liked him for he was always kind in word and action and every one was glad to be jim hoxson's friend but somehow jim seemed to consider himself his best company his mackerel lines were worked briskly as any others when the fish were biting but when the fish were gone he would lean idly on the rail and stare at the waves and clouds he could work a cranberry bog so beautifully that the people for miles round came to look on and take lessons yet when the sun tried to hide in the evening behind a ragged row of trees on a ridge beyond jim's cranberry patch he would lean on his spade and gaze until everything about him seemed yellow he read the bible incessantly yet offended alike the pious saints and critical sinners by never preaching or exhorting and out of everything jim hoxson seemed to extract what it contained of the ideal and the beautiful and when he saw millicent botain he straightway adored the first woman he had met who was alike beautiful intelligent and refined miss milly being human was pleased by the admiration of the handsome manly fellow who seemed so far the superior of the men of his class but when in his honest simplicity he told her that he loved her she declined his further attentions in a manner which though very delicate and kind opened jim's blue eyes to some sad things he had never seen before he neither got drunk nor threatened to kill himself nor married the first silly girl he met but he sensibly left the place where he had suffered so greatly and in a sort of sad daze he hurried off to hide himself in the newly discovered gold fields of california perhaps he had suddenly learned certain properties of gold which were hitherto unknown to him at any rate it was soon understood at spanish stake where he had located himself that jim hoxson got out more gold per week than any man in camp and that it all went to san francisco kind of a mean cuss i reckon remarked a newcomer one day at the saloon when jim alone of the crowd present declined to drink with him not any replied colonel two so called because he had two eyes while another colonel in the camp had but one and it's good for you stranger continued the colonel that you ain't been long in camp else some of the boys have put a hole through you for saying anything against jim for we all swear by him we do he don't carry shootin irons but no feller in camp dares to tackle him he don't cuss nobody and everybody does just as he asks em to as to drinkin why i'd swear off myself if t'd make me hold a candle to him went to old bermuda t'other day when he was ravin tight and layin for butcher pete with a shootin arn and he actually talked bermuda into soakin his head and turnin in everybody else was afeard to go nigh old bermuda that day the newcomer seemed gratified to learn that jim was so peaceable a man that was the natural supposition at least for he forthwith cultivated jim with considerable assiduity and being it was evident a man of considerable taste and experience jim soon found his companionship very agreeable and he lavished upon his new acquaintance who had been nicknamed tarpaulin the many kind and thoughtful attentions which had endeared jim to the other miners the two men lived in the same hut staked claims adjoining each other and tarpaulin who had been thin and nervous-looking when he first came to camp began to grow peaceable and plump under jim's influence 
one night as jim and tarpaulin lay chatting before a fire in their hut they heard a thin wiry voice in the next hut inquiring anybody in this camp look like this tarpaulin started that's a funny question said he let's see who and what the fellow is and then tarpaulin started for the next hut jim waited some time and hearing low voices in earnest conversation went next door himself tarpaulin was not there but two small thin sharp-eyed men were there displaying an old-fashioned daguerreotype of a handsome-looking young man dressed in the latest new york style and more than this jim did not notice don't know him mister said colonel too who happened to be the owner of the hut besides if as is most likely he's growed long hair and a beard since he left the states his own mother wouldn't know him from george washington brother o yourn no said one of the thin men he's well the fact is we'll give a thousand dollars to any one who'll find him for us in twenty-four hours deputy sheriff asked the colonel retiring somewhat hastily under his blankets about the same thing said one of the thin men with a sickly smile git roared the colonel suddenly springing from his bed and cocking his revolver i believe in the golden rule i do the detectives with the fine instinct peculiar to their profession rightly construed the colonel's action as a hint and withdrew and jim retired to his own hut and fell asleep while waiting for his partner morning came but no tarpaulin dinner time arrived but jim ate alone and was rather blue he loved a sociable chat and of late tarpaulin had been almost his sole companion evening came but tarpaulin came not jim couldn't abide the saloon for a whole evening so he lit a candle in his own hut and attempted to read tarpaulin was a lover of newspapers it seemed to jim he received more papers than all the remaining miners put together jim thought he would read some of these same papers and unrolled tarpaulin's blankets to find them when out fell a picture case opening as it fell jim was about to close it again when he suddenly started and exclaimed millicent botain he held it under the light and examined it closely there could be no doubt as to identity there were the same exquisite features which a few months before had opened to jim hoxson a new world of beauty and had then with a sweet yet sad smile knocked down all of his fair castles and destroyed all his exquisite pictures strange that it should appear to him now and so unexpectedly but stranger did it seem to jim that on the opposite side of the case should be a portrait which was a duplicate of the one shown by the detectives that rascal brown exclaimed jim so he succeeded in getting her did he but i shouldn't call him names he had as much right to make love to her as i god grant he may make her happy and he is probably a very fine fellow must be by his looks suddenly jim started as if shocked by an electric battery hiding all the hair and beard of the portrait he stared at it a moment and exclaimed tarpaulin three both gone exclaimed colonel two hurrying into the saloon at noon both gone echoed two or three men yes said the colonel and the queerest thing is they left everything behind every darn thing i never did see such a stampede afore i didn't nobody's got any idea o where they be nor where it's about either don't be too sartin colonel piped weasel a self-contained mite of a fellow who was still at work upon his glass filled at the last general treat although every one else was finished so long ago that they were growing thirsty again don't be too sartin them detectives bunked in my shanty last night the deuce they did cried the colonel good the rest of us didn't know it well said weasel moving his glass in graceful circles to be sure that all the sugar dissolved i dunno it's a respectable business and i wanted to have a good look at em what's that got to do with jim and tarpaulin demanded the colonel fiercely wait and i'll tell you replied weasel provokingly taking a leisurely sip at his glass jim come down to see em what cried the colonel and told him he knew their man and would help find them continued weasel they offered him the thousand dollars oh lord oh lord groaned the colonel 
who's a feller to trust in this world the idea of jim going back on a partner for a thousand i would not believed he's a done it for a million and he told em he'd cram it down their throats if they mentioned it again bully hooray for jim shouted the colonel what'll you take fellers fill high here's to jim the feller that believes his friend's innocent the colonel looked thoughtfully into his glass and remarked as if to his own reflection therein ain't many such men here nor nowhere else after which he drank the toast himself but that don't explain what tarpaulin went fur said the colonel suddenly yes it does said the exasperating weasel shutting his thin lips so tightly that it was hard to see where his mouth was what exclaimed the colonel twould take a four-horse corkscrew to get anything out of you you dried-up little scoundrel why replied weasel greatly pleased by the colonel's compliment after what you said about hair and beard hiding a man one of them fellers cut a card and held it over the picture so as to hide hair and chin the forehead and face and nose and ears was tarpaulin and nobody else's lightnin's blazes roared the colonel ah why tarpaulin hisself came into my shanty and looked at the picture and talked to them about it trot out your glassware barkeeper got to drink to a feller that's as cool as that the boys drank with the colonel but they were too severely astonished to enjoy the liquor particularly in fact old bermuda who had never taken anything but plain rye drank three fingers of claret that day and did not know of it until told the colonel's mind was unusually excited it seemed to him there were a number of probabilities upon which to hang bets he walked outside that his meditation might be undisturbed but in an instant he was back crying lady comin shirt sleeves and trouser legs were hurriedly rolled down shirt collars were buttoned hats were dusted and then each man went leisurely out with the air of having merely happened to leave the saloon an air which imposed upon no disinterested observer coming up the trail beside the creek were a middle-aged gentleman and a young lady both on horseback the gentleman's dress and general style plainly indicated that he was not a miner nor a storekeeper nor a barkeeper while it was equally evident that the lady was neither a washerwoman a cook nor a member of either of the very few professions which were open to ladies on the pacific coast in those days this much every miner quickly decided for himself but after so deciding each miner reached the uttermost extremity of his wits and devoted himself to staring the couple reined in before the saloon and the gentleman drew something small and black and square from his pocket gentlemen said he we are looking for an old friend of ours and have traced him to this camp we scarcely know whether it would be any use to give his name but here is his picture can any one remember having seen the person here every one looked toward colonel too he being the man with the most practical tongue in camp the colonel took the picture and weasel slipped up behind him and looked over his shoulder the colonel looked at the picture abruptly handed it back looked at the young lady and then gazed vacantly into space and seemed very uncomfortable been here but gone said the colonel at length where did he go do you know asked the gentleman while the lady's eyes dropped wearily nobody knows only been gone a day or two replied the colonel the colonel had a well-developed heart and relying on what he considered the correct idea of jim hoxson's mission ventured to say he'll be back in a day or two left all his things suddenly weasel raised his diminutive voice and said the detect the determined grip of the colonel's hand interrupted the communication which weasel attempted to make and the colonel hastily remarked there's a feller gone for him that's sure to fetch him back who who is it asked the young lady hesitatingly well ma'am said the colonel as your father i suppose leastways said tain't much use to give names in this part of the world but the name he's going by is jim hoxson the young lady screamed and fell four whether to do it or not is what bothers me soliloquized mr weasel pacing meditatively in front of the saloon the old man offers me two thousand to get tarpaulin away from them fellers and let him know where to meet him and his daughter 
two thousand's a pretty penny and the bein picked out by so smart a look a man as an honor big enough to set off again a few hundred dollars more but on t'other hand if they catch him they'll come back here and who knows but what they'll want the old man and girl as bad as they want a tarpaulin a bird in the hand's worth two in the bush better keep near the ones i got i reckon here they come now as mr weasel concluded his dialogue with himself mr botain and millicent approached in company with the colonel the colonel stopped just beyond the saloon and said now here's your best pint you can see the hill trail for better'n five miles and the crick for a mile and a half i'll just have a shed knocked together to keep the lady from the sun and keep a stiff upper lip both of yer trust jim hawkson nobody in the mines ever knowed him to fail millicent shivered at the mention of jim's name and the colonel unhappily ignorant of the cause of her agitation tried to divert her mind from the chances of harm to tarpaulin by growing eloquent in praise of jim hawkson suddenly the colonel himself started and grew pale he quickly recovered himself however and with the delicacy of a gentleman walked rapidly away as millicent and her father looked in the direction from which the colonel's surprise came there handcuffed with beard and hair singed close clothes torn and face bleeding walked ethelbert brown between the two detectives while jim hawkson with head bowed and hands behind his back followed a few yards behind some one gave the word at the saloon and the boys hurried out but the colonel pointed significantly toward the sorrowful couple while with the other hand he pointed an ugly pistol cocked toward the saloon millicent hurried from her father's side and flung her arms about the sorry figure of her lover and jim hawkson finding his pathway impeded raised his eyes and then blushed violently sorry for you sir said one of the detectives touching his hat to mr botain but can't help being glad we got a day ahead of you what amount of money will buy your prisoner demanded the unhappy father beg pardon sir very sorry but we'd be compounding felony in that case you know replied one of the officers gazing with genuine pity at the weeping girl don't worry whispered the colonel in mr botain's ear we'll clean out them two fellers and let tarpaulin loose again every fella come here for something darn it with which sympathizing expression the colonel again retired i'll give you as much as the bank offers said mr botain very sorry sir but can't replied the detective we'd be just as bad then in the eyes of the law as before reward five thousand bank lose twenty five thousand thirty thousand in odd figures is least we could take even that wouldn't be regular but it would be a safe risk seeing all the bank cares for us gets money back mr botain groaned we'll make it as pleasant as we can for you sir continued the detective if you and the lady'll go back on the ship with us we'll give him the liberty of the ship as soon as we're well away from the land we'd consider it our duty to watch him of course but we'd try to do it so as not to give offence we've got hearts though we are in this business hope you can buy him a clear when you get home sir i've sacrificed everything to get here i can never clear him sighed mr botain i can exclaimed a clear manly voice millicent raised her eyes and for the first time saw jim hawkson she gave him a look in which astonishment gratitude and fear strove for the mastery and he gave her a straightforward honest respectful look in return the two detectives dropped their lower jaws alarmingly and raised their eyebrows to their hat rims the bank at san francisco has an agent here said jim colonel won't you fetch him the colonel took a lively double quick and soon returned with a business-looking man mr green said jim please tell me how much i have in your bank the clerk looked over a small book he extracted from his pocket and replied briefly over two thousand ounces please give these gentlemen a check made whatever way they like it for the equivalent of thirty thousand dollars i'll sign it said jim the clerk and one of the detectives retired to an adjacent hut and soon called jim jim joined them and immediately he and the officer returned to the prisoner it's all right maxley said the other let him go 
the officer removed the handcuffs and ethelbert brown was free his first motion was to seize jim's hand hawkson tell me why you helped those detectives said he revenge replied jim for what cried brown changing colour gaining milly botain's love replied jim brown looked at millicent and read the story from her face he turned toward jim a wondering look and asked slowly then why did you free me because she loved you said jim and then he walked quietly away five why miss pekin it's a fact even javash that went out better'n a year ago has got back and he was at the next diggin's and heard all about it seems the officers catched brown and jim hawks and gave him thirty thousand dollars to pay him and the bank too and then they let him go might's well kept his money though seein brown washed overboard on the way back i ain't a bettin man said the deacon but i'd risk our white-faced cow that them thirty thousand dollars preached the greatest sermon ever heerd in california uh in crank it either miss perkin threw a withering glance at the deacon it was good he was not on trial for heresy with miss pekin for judge and jury she continued eben says there was a fella named weasel that hid close by and heerd all twas said and when he went to the rum shop and told the miners they who raid for jim as if they was mad just like them crazy fellers they ain't no idea when money's wasted the lord waste all the money in the world that way devoutly exclaimed the deacon and that feller weasel continued miss pekin giving the deacon's pet cat a vicious kick though he'd always been economical and never set a bad example before by persuadin folk to be intemperate actually drawed a pistol and fit with a feller they call colonel too fit for the chance o askin the crowd to drink to jim oxen and then went round to all the diggins tellin about jim and wastin his money treatin folks to drink good luck to jim disgraceful it's what i call a powerful conversion remarked the deacon but there's more said miss pekin with a sigh and yet with an air of importance befitting the bearer of wonderful tidings what eagerly asked mrs crankett jim's back said miss pekin mercy on us cried mrs crankett the lord bless and prosper him earnestly exclaimed the deacon well said miss pekin with a disgusted look i s'pose he will from the looks of things for eben says that when weasel told the fellers how it all was they went to work and put gold dust in a box for jim till there was more than he give for brown and fellers from all rounds been sendin him dust ever since he's mighty sight the richest man anywhere near this town good bless the lord cried the deacon with delight you ain't heard all of it though continued miss perkins with a funereal countenance they're going to be married sakes alive gasped mrs crankett it's so said miss pekin and they say she went for him by way of the isthmus and he come back that way bad enough to marry him when poor brown ain't been dead six months but to send for him was a real noble big-hearted womanly thing to do declared mrs crankett snatching off her spectacles and i'd done it myself if i'd been her the deacon gave his old wife an enthusiastic hug upon seeing which miss pekin hastily departed with a severely shocked expression of countenance and a nose aspiring heavenward End of story two. story three of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story three making his mark black hat was in eighteen fifty one about as peaceful and well regulated a village as could be found in the united states it was not on the road to any place so it grew but little the dirt paid steadily and well so but few of the original settlers went away the march of civilization with its churches and circuses had not yet reached black hat marriages never convulsed the settlement with the pet excitement of villagers generally and the inhabitants were never arrayed at swords point by either religion politics or newspapers 
to be sure the boys gambled every evening and all day sunday but a famous player who once passed that way on a prospecting trip declared that even a preacher would get sick of such playing for as everybody knew everybody else's game and as all men who played other than squarely had long since been required to leave there was an utter absence of pistols at the table occasionally disagreements took place to be sure they have been taking place even among the best people since the days of cain and abel but all difficulties at black hat which did not succumb to force of jaw were quietly locked in the bosoms of the disputants until the first sunday sunday at black hat orthodoxically commenced at sunset on saturday and was piously extended through to working time on monday morning and during this period of thirty-six hours there was submitted to arbitrament by knife or pistol all unfinished rows of the week on sunday was also performed all of the hard drinking at black hat but through the week the inhabitants worked as steadily and lived as peacefully as if surrounded by church steeples courthouses and jails whether owing to the inevitable visitations of the great disturber of affairs at the garden of eden or only in the due course of that development which affects communities as well as species we know not but certain it is that suddenly the city fathers at black hat began to wear thoughtful faces and wrinkled brows to indulge in unusual periods of silence and to drink and smoke as if these consoling occupations were pursued more as a matter of habit than of enjoyment the prime cause of the uneasiness of these good men was a red-faced red-haired red-whiskered fellow who had been nicknamed captain on account of the military cut of the whiskers mentioned above the captain was quite a good fellow but he was suffering severely from the last infirmity of noble minds ambition he had gone west to make a reputation and so openly did he work for it that no one doubted his object and so untiring and convincing was he that in two short weeks he had persuaded the weaker of the brethren at black hat that things in general were considerably out of joint and as a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump every man at black hat was soon discussing the captain's criticisms and was neglecting the more peaceful matters of cards and drink which had previously occupied their leisure hours the captain was always fully charged with opinions on every subject and his eloquent voice was heard at length on even the smallest matter that interested the camp one day a disloyal miner remarked captain's jaws is a regular air trigger reckon he'll run the camp when whitey leaves straightway a devout respecter of the powers that be carried the remark to whitey the chief of the camp now it happened that whitey an immense but very peaceable and sensible fellow had just been discussing with some of his adherents the probable designs of the captain and this new report seemed to arrive just in time for whitey instantly said thar he goes again do you see pokin his shovel in all round now if the boys want me to leave they can say so and i'll go tain't the easiest claim in the world to work runnin this camp ain't and i'll never hanker to be chief nowhere else but seein i've stuck to the boys and seen em through from the fust twouldn't be exactly gentlemanly pears to me and for a moment whitey hid his emotions in a tin cup from which escaped perfumes suggesting the rye fields of kentucky nobody wants you to go whitey said wolverine one of the chief's most faithful supporters didn't you kick that new hampshire fellow out of camp when he kept a saying the saloon was the gates of hell well said the chief with a flush of modest pride i don't deny it but i won't remind the boys of it if they forgot it and didn't you go to work said another when all the fellers was a askin what was to be done with them chineseers didn't you just order the boys to clean em out to onct that ain't the best thing you done neither exclaimed a third 
i wonder does any of them galoots forget how the saloon got afire when everybody was asleep how the chief turned out the camp and after the barkeeper got out the door how the chief rushed in and rolled out all three of the barrels and then went dead bent for the river with his clothes all a blazin where we been for a couple of weeks if it hadn't been for them barrels the remembrance of this gallant act so affected wolverine that he exclaimed whitey we'll stick to yer like tar and feather and if captain and his friends get troublesome we'll just show em the trail and suggest they big enough to get up a concern of their own instead of trying to steal somebody else's the chief felt that he was still dear to the hearts of his subjects and so many took pains that day to renew their allegiance that he grew magnanimous in fact when the chief that evening invited the boys to drink he pushed his own particular bottle to the captain an attention as delicate as that displayed by a clergyman when he invites into his pulpit the minister of a different creed still the captain labored so often did the latter stand treat that the barkeeper suddenly ran short of liquor and was compelled for a week to restrict general treats to three per diem until he could lay in a fresh stock the captain could hit corks and half dollars in the air almost every time but no opportunity occurred in which he could exercise his marksmanship for the benefit of the camp he also told any number of good stories at which the boys whitey included laughed heartily he sang jolly songs with a very fair tenor voice and all the boys joined in the chorus and he played a banjo in style which always set the boys to capering as gracefully as a crowd of bachelor bears but still whitey remained in camp and in office and the captain who was as humane as he was ambitious had no idea of attempting to remove the old chief by force on monday night the whole camp retired early and slept soundly monday had at all times a very short evening at black hat for the boys were generally weary after the duties and excitements of sunday but on this particular monday a slide had threatened on the hillside and the boys had been hard at work cutting and carrying huge logs to make a break or barricade so soon after supper they took a drink or two and sprinkled to their several huts and black hat was at peace there were no dogs or cats to make night hideous no uneasy roosters to be sounding alarm at unearthly hours no horrible policemen thumping the sidewalks with clubs no fashionable or dissipated people rattling about in carriages excepting an occasional cough or sneeze or overloud snore the most perfect peace reigned at black hat suddenly a low but heavy rumble and a trembling of the ground roused every man in camp and rushing out of their huts the miners saw a mass of stone and earth had been loosened far up the hillside and were breaking over the barricade in one place and coming down in a perfect torrent they were fortunately moving toward the river on a line obstructed by no houses though the hut of old miller who was very sick was close to the rocky torrent but while they stared a young pine tree perhaps a foot thick which had been torn loose by the rocks and brought down by them suddenly tumbled root first over a steep rock a few feet in front of old miller's door the leverage exerted by the lower portion of the stem threw the whole tree into a vertical position for an instant then it caught the wind tottered and finally fell directly on the front of old miller's hut crushing in the gable and a portion of the front door and threatening the hut and its unfortunate occupant with immediate destruction a deep groan and many terrible oaths burst from the boys and then with one impulse they rushed to the tree and attempted to move it but it lay at an angle of about forty-five degrees from the horizontal its roots heavy with dirt on the ground in front of the door and its top high in the air the boys could only lift the lower portion but should they do so then the hut would be entirely crushed by the full weight of the tree there was no window through which they could get miller out and there was no knowing how long the frail hut could resist the weight of the tree 
suddenly a well-known voice was heard shouting keep your head level miller old chap we'll have you out of that in no time hurry up somebody and borrow the barkeeper's ropes while i'm cuttin throw a rope over the top and when she commences to go haul all together and suddenly then twill clear the hut in an instant later the boys saw by the bright moonlight the captain bareheaded barefooted with open shirt standing on the tree directly over the crushed gable and chopping with frantic rapidity hooray for cap'n shouted some one hooray replied the crowd and a feeble hooray was heard from between the logs of old miller's hut two or three men came hurrying back with the ropes and one of them was dexterously thrown across a branch of the tree then the boys distributed themselves along both ends of the rope easy screamed the captain plenty of time i'll give the word when i say now pull quick and together i won't be long and big chips flew in undiminished quantity while a commendatory murmur ran along both lines of men and whitey the chief knelt with his lips to one of the chinks of the hut and assured old miller that he was perfectly safe now shrieked the captain suddenly in his excitement he stepped toward the top instead of the root of the tree in an instant the top of the tree was snatched from the hut but it tossed the unfortunate captain into the air as easily as a sling tosses a stone every one rushed to the spot where he had fallen they found him senseless and carried him to the saloon where the candles were already lighted one of the miners who had been a doctor promptly examined his bruises and exclaimed he's two or three broken ribs that's all it's a wonder he didn't break every bone in his body he'll be around all right inside of a month gentlemen said whitey i resign all in favor of the captain will please say i i replied every one i don't put the nose continued whitey cause i'm a peaceable man and don't want to have to kick any man mean enough to vote no captain you're a boss of this camp and i'm yourn obediently the captain opened his eyes slowly and replied i'm much obliged boys but i won't give whitey the trouble doctor's mistaken there's something broken inside and i haven't got many minutes more to live do your best captain said the barkeeper encouragingly promise me you'll stay alive and i'll go straight down to frisco and get you all the champagne you can drink you're very kind replied the captain faintly but i'm sent for and i've got to go i've left the east to make my mark but i didn't expect to make it in real estate whitey i was a fool for wanting to be chief of black hat and you've forgiven me like a gentleman and a christian it's getting dark I i'm thirsty I i'm gone gone the doctor felt the captain's wrist and said fact gentlemen he's panned his last dirt do the honors boys said the barkeeper placing glasses along the bar each man filled his glass and all looked at whitey boys said whitey solemnly if the captain had struck a nugget good luck might a spiled him and he'd a been chief of black hat or any other place he might have got shot but he's made his mark so nobody begrudges him and nobody can rub it out so here's to the captain's mark a dead sure thing bottoms up the glasses were emptied in silence and turned bottoms uppermost on the bar the boys were slowly dispersing when one who was strongly suspected of having been a church member remarked he was took of a sudden so he shouldn't be stuck up whitey turned to him and replied with some asperity young man you'll be lucky if you're stuck up as high as the captain and all the boys understood what whitey meant end of story three Story four of a Romance of California Life by John Haberton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story four Cotago. Two o'clock AM is supposed to be a popular sleeping hour the world over, and as Flatfoot Bar was a portion of the terrestrial sphere, it was but natural to expect its denizens to be in bed at that hour 
yet on a certain morning twenty years ago when there was neither sickness nor a fashionable entertainment to excuse irregular hours and camp a bright light streamed from the only window of chagras charlie's residence at flatfoot bar and inside of the walls of chagras charlie's domicile were half a dozen miners engaged in earnest conversation flatfoot bar had never formally elected a town committee for the half-dozen men aforesaid had long ago modestly assumed the duties and responsibilities of city fathers and so judicious had been their conduct that no one had ever expressed a desire for a change in government the six men in half a dozen different positions surrounded chagras charlie's fire and gazed into it as intently as if they were fire worshippers awaiting the utterances of a salamanderish oracle but the doughty puritans of cromwell's time while they trusted in god carefully protected their powder from moisture and the devout mohammedan to this day ties up his camel at night before committing it to the keeping of the higher powers so it was but natural that the anxious ones at flatfoot bar vigorously ventilated their own ideas while they longed for light and knowledge they ain't ornaments to camp no way you can fix it them greasers ain't said a tall miner bestowing an effective kick upon a stick of firewood which had departed a short distance from his neighbors mississip's right fellers said the host they ain't got the slightest idea of the duties of citizens they show themselves down to the saloon to be sure and i never seed one of em a waterin his liquor but when you've said that you said everything our distinguished friend speaks truthfully remarked nappy bonny the only frenchman in camp and possessing a nickname playfully contracted from the name of the first emperor la gloire is nothing to them comprehends any one that they know not even of france's most illustrious son le petit caparol that's bad to be sure said texas cutting an enormous chew of tobacco and passing both plug and knife but that might be overlooked maybe the schools down in mexico ain't up with the times what i'm down on is they hain't got none of the edication that comes natural to a gentleman even ef he never seed the outside of a schoolhouse who ever heerd of one of em havin a difficulty with any gentleman at the saloon or on the crick they draw a good deal o blood and it's allers from some o their own kind and up there by emselves if they had a grain o public spirit not to say liberality they'd do some o their amusements before the rest of us instead o gougin the camp out of its constitutional amusements why i've knowed the time when i've held in fur six hours on a stretch till there could be fellers enough round to get a good deal of enjoyment out of it they wash out a sight of dust growled lem taps from the massachusetts shoe district but i never could get one of em to put up an ounce on a game they just play by emselves and keep all their washins to home blarst em all let's give em tickets of leave and show em the trail roared bracelets a stout englishman who had on each wrist a red scar which had suggested his name and unpleasant situations i believe in fair play but i daren't keep my eyes off o of them sleepy lookin tops when their flippers is anywheres near their knives you know well what's to be done to em demanded lynn taps all this john's well enough but john never cleared out anybody except that time samson tried and then it come from an individual that wasn't related to any of this crowd let em alone till next time they get into a muss and then clean em out o camp said chagras charlie let's have it understood that while this camp cheerfully recognizes the right of a gentleman to shoot at sight and lay out his man that it considers stabbin in the darks the same thing as murder them's our principles and folks might's well know them fust as last good lord what's that all the men started to their feet at the sound of a long loud yell that's one of em now ejaculated mississip with a huge oath nobody but a greaser can holler that way sounds like the last despairing cry of a dying mule 
there's only eight or nine of em and each of us is good for two greasers apiece let's make em git this minute and mrs sip dashed out of the door followed by the other five revolvers in hand the mexicans lived together in a hut made of raw hides one of which constituted the door the devoted six reached the hut texas snatched aside the hide and each man presented his pistol at full cock but no one fired on the contrary each man slowly dropped his pistol and opened his eyes there was no newly made corpse visible nor did any greasers savagely wave a bloody stiletto but on the ground insensible lay a mexican woman and about her stood seven or eight greasers each looking even more dumb incapable and solemn than usual the city fathers felt themselves in an awkward position and mrs sip finally asked in the meekest of tones what's the matter she cotigo's wife softly replied a mexican they fight in chihuahua he run away she follow she come here now this minute she fall on cotigo she say something we know not he scream and run he's a low-lived scoundrel said chagres charley between his teeth if my wife thort enough of me to follow me to the diggins i wouldn't do much runnin away he's a regular black-hearted white-livered sh whispered nappy the frenchman as the lady is recovering and she may have a heart maria madre purissima low wailed the woman mi nino mi nino perdito what she a sayin asked lynn taps in a whisper she talk about a little boy lost said the mexican and her husband gone too poor woman said chagres charley in the most sympathizing tones ever heard at flatfoot bar but a doctor be more good to her just now than forty sich husbands as hern where's the nearest doctor fellows continued chagres charley up to dutch hill said texas and i'll see he's fetched inside of two hours saying which texas dropped the rawhide door and hurried off the remaining five strolled slowly back to chagres charley's hut them greasers ain't never got nothin said mrs sip suddenly and that woman'll lay there on the bare ground all night for they think of makin her comfortable who's got an extra blanket i said each of the four others and nappy boney expressed the feeling of the whole party by exclaiming the blue sky's enough good to cover man when woman needs blankets hastily mrs sip collected the four extra blankets and both of his own and as he sped toward the mexican hut he stopped several times by the way to dexterously snatch blankets from sleeping forms here ye be said he suddenly entering the mexican hut and startling the inmates into crossing themselves violently make the poor thing a decent bed and we'll have a doctor here pretty soon mrs Ip had barely vanished when a light scratching was heard on the door a mexican opened it and saw nappy boney with extended hand and bottle it is the haute vie of la belle france he whispered tenderly i have cherished but it is at the lady's service chagres charley lynn taps and bracelets were composing their nerves with pipes about the fire they had surrounded early in the morning lynn taps had just declared his disbelief of a soul inside of the mexican frame when the door was thrown open and an excited mexican appeared her tongue come back he cried she say she come over mountain she bring little boy she no eat it was long time soon she must die boy must die what she do she put round boy her cloak and leave him by rock and hurry to tell maybe coyote get him what can do what can we do echoed lynn taps turn out every galoot in camp and follow her tracks till we find it souls or no souls don't make no difference i'll trap my legs off afore that child shall be left out in the snow in them mountains within five minutes every man in camp had been aroused each man swore frightfully at being prematurely turned out each man hated the greasers with all his heart and soul and strength but each man as he learned what was the matter made all possible haste and fluently cursed all who were slower than himself in fact two or three irrepressible spirits consuming with delay started alone on independent lines of search chagres charley appeared promptly and assumed command 
boy said he we'll sprinkle out into a line a couple of miles long and march up the mountain till we reach the snow when i think it's time i'll fire three times and then each feller face and tramp to the right keepin a keerful lookout for a woman's tracks pintin toward camp there can be no mistakin em for them senoritas has the littlest kind of feet when any feller finds her tracks he'll fire and then we'll rally on him i wish them other fellers instead of goin off half cocked had tracked cottago the low-lived skunk to think of him runnin away from wife and young one too forward git they hain't got no souls that's what made him do it charlie said lynn taps as the men deployed steadily the miners ascended the rugged slope rocks trees fallen trunks and treacherous holes impeded their progress but did not stop them a steady wind cut them to the bone and grew more keen and fierce as they neared the snow suddenly chagres charlie fired and the boys faced to the right a moment later another shot rallied the party those nearest it found nappy boney in a high state of excitement and leaning over a footprint mon dieu he cried they have not esprit these mexicans but her footprints might have been made by the adorable feet of one of my countrywomen it is so small yes said mississip and one of them fellers that started ahead has found it first for here's a man's track a-goin up rapidly the excited miners followed the tracks through the snow and found them gradually leading to the regular trail across the mountain which trail few men ventured upon at that season suddenly the men in advance stopped here tis i reckon cried mississip springing across a small cleft in the rocks and running toward a dark object lying on the sheltered side of a small cliff good god he continued as he stooped down it's got to go and he's froze stiff serve him right cuss him growled lynn taps i almost wish he had a soul so he could catch it good and hot now he's gone he's got his pack with him shouted mississip and a hugging it as tight as if he could take it to to wherever he's gone to no man with a soul could have been cool enough to pack up his traps after seeing that poor woman's face argued lynn taps mississip tore off a piece of his trousers struck fire with flint and steel poured on whiskey and blew it into flame rapidly the miners straggled up the trail and halted opposite mississip well i'll be durned shouted the latter he ain't got no shirt on and there's an ugly cut on his arm beats anything i ever seed one by one the miners leaped the cleft and crowded about mississip and stared it was certain a gotta go and there was certainly his pack made up in his poncho in the usual greaser manner and held tightly in his arms but while they stared there was a sudden movement of the pack itself lynn taps gave a mighty tug at it extricated it from the dead man's grasp and rapidly undid it suddenly by the glare of a fresh light the boy saw the face of a rather dirty large-eyed brown-skinned mexican baby and the baby probably by way of recognition raised high a voice such as the boys never heard before on that side of the rocky mountains here's what that cut in his arms means shouted a miner who had struck a light on the trail there's a finger mark done in blood on the snow by the side of the trail and a pointin right to that ledge and here's a shirt a flappin on a stick stuck in a snow bank lookin toward the camp there ain't no doubt about what the woman said to him or what made him yell and git boys said chagres charlie solemnly as he took a blanket from his shoulders and spread it on the ground mississip took off his hat and lifting the poor mexican from the snow laid him on the blanket lynn taps hid the baby rewrapped under his own blanket and hurried down the mountain while four men picked up gotago and followed lynn taps scratched on the rawhide door the doctor opened it lynn taps unrolled the bundle and its occupant again raised its voice the woman who was lying motionless and with closed eyes sprang to her feet in an instant and as lynn taps laid his burden on the blankets the woman her every dull feature softened and lighted with motherly tenderness threw her arms about the astonished yankee and then fell sobbing at his feet 
you've brought her the only medicine that'll do her any good said the doctor giving the baby a gentle dig under the ribs as he picked up his saddle-bags lynn taps made a hasty escape and reached the saloon which had been hurriedly opened as the crowd was heard approaching the bearers of the body deposited it gently on the floor and the crowd filed in quietly lynn taps walked up to the bar and rapped upon it walk up boys he said fill high hats off here's gotta go maybe he didn't have a soul but if he didn't souls ain't needed in this world bottoms up every man the toast was drunk quietly and reverently and when it was suggested that the greasers themselves should have participated they were all summoned and the same toast was drank again the next day as the body of gotago was being carried to a newly dug grave on the high ground overlooking the creek and the mexicans stood about as if dumb staring and incessant smoking were the only proprieties to be observed on such occasions lynn taps thoughtfully offered his arm to the weeping widow and so sorrowful was she throughout the performance of the sad rites that lynn taps was heard to remark that however it might be with the men there could be no doubt about mexican women's possessing souls as a few weeks later the widow became mrs lynn taps there can be no doubt that her second husband's final convictions were genuine End of story four. story five of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story five the last pike at jagger's bend where they came from no one knew among the farmers near the bend there was ample ability to conduct researches beset by far more difficulties than was that of the origin of the pikes but a charge of buckshot which a good-natured yankee received one evening soon after putting questions to a venerable pike exerted a depressing influence upon the spirit of investigation they were not bloodthirsty these pikes but they had good reason to suspect all inquirers of being at least deputy sheriffs if not worse and a pike's hatred of officers of the law is equalled in intensity only by his hatred for manual labor but while there was doubt as to the fatherland of the little colony of pikes at jaeger's bend their every neighbor would willingly make affidavit as to the cause of their locating and remaining at the bend when humanitarians and optimists argued that it was because the water was good and convenient that the bend itself caught enough driftwood for fuel and that the dirt would yield a little gold when manipulated by placer and pan all farmers and stock owners would freely admit the validity of these reasons but the admission was made with a countenance whose indignation and sorrow indicated that the greater causes were yet unnamed with eyes speaking emotions which words could not express they would point to sections of wheat fields minus the grain-bearing heads to hides and hoofs of cattle unslaughtered by themselves to mothers of promising calves whose tender bleeding answered not the maternal call to the places which had once known fine horses but had been untenanted since certain pikes had gone across the mountains for game they would accuse no man wrongfully but in a country where all farmers had wheat and cattle and horses and where prowling indians and mexicans were not how could these disappearances occur but to people owning no property in the neighborhood to tourists and artists the pike settlement at the bend was as interesting and ugly as a sky terrier the architecture of the village was of original style and no duplicate existed of the half-dozen residences one was composed exclusively of sod another of bark yet another of poles roofed with a wagon cover and plastered on the outside with mud the fourth was of slabs nicely split from logs which had drifted into the bend the fifth was of hide stretched over a frame strictly gothic from foundation to ridgepole while the sixth burrowed into the hillside displayed only the barrel which formed its chimney a more aristocratic community did not exist on the pacific coast 
visit the pikes when you would you could never see any one working of churches schoolhouses stores and other plebeian institutions there were none and no pike demeaned himself by entering trade or soiled his hands by agriculture yet unto this peaceful contented neighbourhood there found his way a visitor who had been everywhere in the world without once being made welcome he came to the house built of slabs and threatened the wife of sam trotwine owner of the house and sam after sunning himself uneasily for a day or two mounted a pony and rode off for a doctor to drive the intruder away when he returned he found all the men in the camp seated on a log in front of his own door and then he knew he must prepare for the worst only one of the great influences of the world could force every pike from his own door at exactly the same time there they sat yellow-faced bearded long-backed and bent each looking like the other find all like sam and as he dismounted they all looked at him how is she said sam tying his horse and the doctor's while the latter went in well said the oldest man with deliberation the women's all lar if that's any sign each man on the log inclined his head slightly but positively to the left thus manifesting belief that sam had been correctly and sufficiently answered sam himself seemed to regard his information in about the same manner suddenly the rawhide which formed the door of sam's house was pushed aside and a woman came out and called sam and he disappeared from his log as he entered his hut all the women lifted sorrowful faces and retired no one even lingered for the pike has not the common human interest in other people's business he lacks that as well as certain similar virtues of civilization sam dropped by the bedside and was human his heart was in the right place and though heavily entrenched by years of laziness and whiskey and tobacco it could be brought to the front and it came now the dying woman cast her eyes appealingly at the surgeon and that worthy stepped outside the door then the yellow-faced woman said sam doctor says i ain't got much time left nary said sam i wish to god i could die for you the children it's them i want to talk about sam replied his wife and i wish they could die with me rather than have em live as i've had to not that you ain't been a kind husband to me for you have whenever i wanted meat you got it somehow and when you've been ugly drunk you kept away from the house but i'm dying sam and it's cause you've killed me good god mary cried the astonished sam jumping up you're crazy here doctor doctor can't do no good sam keep still and listen ev you love me like you once said you did for i haven't got much breath left gasped the woman mary said the aggrieved sam i swore to god i don't know what you're driving at it's jest this sam replied the woman you took me tellin me you'd love me and honor me and protect me you mean to say now you done it i'm a dyin sam i ain't got no favors to ask of nobody and i'm tellin the truth not knowin what word'll be my last then tell a feller where the killin came in mary for heaven's sake said the unhappy sam it's come in all along sam said the woman there is women in the state so i've heard that married for a home and bread and butter but you promised more'n that sam and i've waited on it ain't come and there's something in me that's all starved and cut to pieces and it's your fault sam i took you for better or for worse and i've never grumbled i know you ain't mary whispered the conscience-stricken pike and i know what you mean if god'll only let you be for a few years i'll see if the thing can't be helped don't cuss me mary i've never knowed how i've been a-goin i wish there was something i could do for you go to pay yer all i owe yer i'd go back on everything that makes life worth havin pay it to the children sam said the sick woman raising herself in her miserable bed i'll forgive yer everything if you'll do the right thing for them do do everything said the woman throwing up her arms and falling backward her husband's arm caught her his lips brought to her wan face a smile 
which the grim visitor who an instant later stole her breath pityingly left in full possession of the rightful inheritance from which it had been so long excluded sam knelt for a moment with his face beside his wife what he said or did the lord only knew but the doctor who was of a speculative mind afterwards said that when sam appeared at the door he showed the first pike face in which he had ever seen any signs of a soul sam went to the sod house where lived the oldest woman in the camp and briefly announced the end of his wife then after some consultation with the old woman sam rode to town on one of his horses leading another he came back with but one horse and a large bundle and soon the women were making for mrs trotwine her last earthly robe and the first new one she had worn for years the next day a wagon brought a coffin and a minister and the whole camp silently and respectfully followed mrs trotwine to a home with which she could find no fault for three days all the male pikes in the camp sat on the log in front of sam's door and expressed their sympathy as did the three friends of job that is they held their peace but on the fourth their tongues were unloosed as a conversationalist the pike is not a success but sam's actions were so unusual and utterly unheard of that it seemed as if even the stones must have wondered and communed among themselves i never heerd of such a thing said brown buck he's gone and bought new clothes for each of the four young uns yes said the patriarch of the camp and this morning when i went down to the bank to soak my head cause last night's liquor didn't agree with it i seed sam with all his young uns as they was a washin their faces and hands with soap they'll catch their death and be on the hill with their mother for long if he don't look out somebody ought to reason with him won't do no good sighed limping jim he's lost his head and reason just goes into one ear and out t'other when he was scrapin round the front door t'other day and i asked him what he was a layin the ground all bare and desolate for he said he was done keepin pig pen now everybody but him knows he never had a pig his head's gone just mark my words on the morning of the fourth day sam's friends had just secured a full attendance on the log and were at work upon their first pipes when they were startled by seeing sam harness his horse in the wagon and put all his children into it what are you bound for sam asked the patriarch sam blushed as near as a pike could but answered with only a little hesitation going to take em to school to maxfield going to do it every day the incumbent of the log was too nearly paralyzed to remonstrate but after a few moments of silence the patriarch remarked in tones of feeling yet decision he's ed a tough time of it but he's no business to ruin the settlement i'm an old man myself and i need peace of mind so i'm going to pack up my traps and mosey when the folks at maxfield knows what he's doing they'll make him a constable or a justice and i'm too much of a man to live nigh any sitch and next day the patriarch wheeled his family and property to parts unknown a few days later jim merrick a brisk farmer a few miles from the bend stood in front of his own house and shaded his eyes in solemn wonder it couldn't be he'd never heard of such a thing before and yet it was there was no doubt of it there was a pike riding right toward him in open daylight he could swear that pike had often visited him that is his wheat field and corral after dark but a daylight visit from a pike was as unusual as a social call of a samaritan upon a jew and when sam for it was he approached merrick and made his business known the farmer was more astonished and confused than he had ever been in his life before sam wanted to know for how much money merrick would plough and plant a hundred and sixty acres of wheat for him and whether he would take sam's horse a fine animal brought from the states and for which sam could show a bill of sale as security for the amount until he could harvest and sell his crop merrick so well understood the pike nature that he made a very liberal offer and afterwards said he would have paid handsomely for the chance a few days later and the remaining pikes at the bend experienced the greatest scare that had ever visited their souls 
a brisk man came into the bend with a tripod on his shoulder and a wire chain and some wire pens and a queer machine under his arm and before dark the pikes understood that sam had deliberately constituted himself a renegade by entering a quarter section of land next morning two more residences were empty and the remaining fathers of the hamlet adorned not sam's log but wandered about with faces vacant of all expression save the agony of the patriot who sees his home invaded by corrupting influences too powerful for him to resist then merrick sent up a gang plough and eight horses and the tender green of sam's quarter section was rapidly changed to a dull brown colour which is odious unto the eye of the pike day by day the brown spot grew larger and one morning sam arose to find all his neighbours departed having wreaked their vengeance upon him by taking away his dogs and in his delight at their disappearance sam freely forgave them all regularly the children were carried to and from school and even to sunday school regularly every evening sam visited the grave on the hillside and came back to lie by the hour looking at the sleeping darlings little by little farmers began to realize that their property was undisturbed little by little sam's wheat grew and waxed golden and then there came a day when a man from frisco came and changed it into a heavier gold more gold than sam had ever seen before and the farmers began to stop in to see sam and their children came to see his and kind women were unusually kind to the orphans and as day by day sam took his solitary walk on the hillside the load on his heart grew lighter until he ceased to fear the day when he too would lie there End of story five.